Hello, welcome everybody. Um, so uh, we have a special um, seminar today with slightly different schedule for the series of the Boost of Collaboration. Uh, the reason is that Damon, um, who's our speaker today, is in Australia and he kindly agreed to speak at midnight, but uh, having him speak at 2 a.m. would have been a little too much. Um, so uh, just an announcement, next week, the seminar will be given by uh, Baur uh, Mukametsanov uh, from the IS uh, at the usual time, which is going to be 12 noon uh, Eastern time. Uh, and with that, uh, we're very glad to have Damon Binder from Princeton today. He'll tell us about the link categories in quantum field theory. Thank you. Oh, thanks for the invitation to speak. Um, so today I'm going to talk about still in categories um, and how they appear um, when we analytically continue quantum field theories. Um, and this is work I did with Slava Richkov, um, and you can read all about it um, at this archive paper. So, hang on, sorry. Uh, let's start with some motivation. So, as we all know, um, a very common starting model to study QFTs is the ON model. We have n scalar fields, phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, so on. Um, and we couple them together using some Lagrangian that preserves the ON symmetry. So if, if we rotate any of the phi fields into one another, um, the Lagrangian remains invariant. Um, and when we do this, we can then study various physical quantities in this model. We could, for instance, compute um, the critical dimension of the phi field. Um, and there are various schemes to do this, like the 4 minus epsilon expansion or the large n expansion. Um, but whenever we do this, we always find that the parameter n, the number of fields we start with, just enters as some parameter um, in our model. Um, and so it's very natural to ask, like, can we just take n to be any real number? What stops us from plugging n equals, say, three and a half into this formula? Um, and would that mean anything? Um, so this might seem like a, a bit of an academic question. Um, coming from a Hanergy theorist. Um, but there is actually like a very concrete statistical mechanical models um, for which it's very natural to, to let n be any arbitrary real number. Um, and to derive these, we can start by thinking about what an ON model looks like on the lattice. So you can imagine, say we're in two dimensions, we have this lattice. Uh, and at every point on the lattice, we'll have a spin variable, SI. Um, it'll be some unit vector. Um, and we couple neighboring lattice points um, with some ON invariant interaction like this. Uh, and the interaction strength K we can vary, um, and we can do perturbation theory in K. Um, when we do this and then integrate over each individual spin, um, what we find um, is that we have a perturbative expansion in terms of loop diagrams. Um, essentially, every link between two neighboring sites is a power of K. Uh, and every time we get a closed loop, we get a factor of n. Um, so we can compute the partition function in this way, for instance. And now the number of um, spins, um, the, the on group, the, the n parameter, we have just enters as some number that tells us how to weight each spin configuration. So here there's no reason that n has to be an integer. It could be any number we like. Um, and it's not just the partition function we could define in this way. Uh, if we look at a diagram with a defect, for instance, we could compute the correlation function involving a two-point function um, or higher point functions. These models have second-order phase transitions, uh, and their phase transitions are in the same universality class um, as the regular ON models we would study in QFT. Um, so these really do continue ON models to non-integer values of n, uh, and rather famously, uh, if you look at the n limits to zero case of the ON models, this gives you the critical exponents for self-avoiding random walk. In the loop models, you can see this because now each loop gives a factor of zero. So in other words, you just remove all configurations that have any closed loops in them. So this is just one example of an analytic continuation that is useful to consider. Uh, and here I've listed a few more. So the QPOTS model, for instance, um, can be used to study percolation in the Q equals one limit. Um, the QPOTS model uh, involves looking at clusters, Q different clusters, uh, types of spins. 
so it doesn't really make a lot of sense to limit Q to one from say a QFT perspective, but it's still very useful for computing critical list components in StatMec. Um, a similar flavor trick is the replica trick. If we want to study models with quench disorder, one way to do this is to take n copies of our theory, couple it in some way, and then study the n goes to zero limit of this, this um, theory. Once again, the only way to make sense of this is to, to let n be small but non-zero so that we can actually study this limit. Uh, and finally, an example, which I won't talk about much in this talk, um, but is very commonly used in physics, is dimensional regularization and, and the four minus epsilon expansion. In this case, we're not taking a global symmetry to be fractional, but we're taking uh, the space-time symmetry to be fractional. Uh, in all of these cases, it's very unclear, at least naively, what these models are and if they make any sense. Um, what are local operators if you don't have, uh, if you have ON symmetry where N is not an integer? Or what are the correlation functions? Um, as we shall see, actually, the best, question, the, the, the best way to analyze these theories is to first consider their symmetries. So in this talk, what we're going to do is we're going to make sense of what it means to have ON symmetry when n is not an integer. Um, and once we do, what we'll find is it's quite straightforward then to answer the question of what local correlators are, what local operators are. Um, so to start, uh, what are symmetries good for? Why do we care about them in QFT? Well, I mean, they're useful for a lot of things. Like, for instance, they're invariant under RG flows. Um, but for our purposes, uh, they serve two crucial roles. The first is that states and operators are classified by representations of the symmetry group. Um, so the symmetry group tells me exactly what operators are allowed to exist in the theory. Um, and the second thing it tells me is that correlation functions or scattering matrices or, or any other physical observable I care to compute um, must be an invariant tensor. And of course, the structure of this invariant tensor is determined by specifically what representations appear in the correlator. So from this description, it's clear that what we really care about is not so much the group itself, but rather the representation theory of the group, its representations and their invariant tensors. Uh, mathematicians will parcel this information up into something called rep G for the group G. Um, and what this is, is a, is a symmetric tensor category. Um, so we're now going to go through uh, and discuss a little bit what exactly this symmetric tensor category is. Um, but the idea is once we do so, what we find is we can immediately generalize the notion of a symmetry from a regular group to any tensor category. Because the tensor category will tell us what exactly the representations or more generally objects are, and it will tell us what the invariant tensors are, or morphisms in the more abstract language. So let's start with just the basics. What, a, what is a category? Um, we're going to do this concretely by thinking about what properties the representations of the group have. Um, so when we look at group theory, we really care about the representations of the group. And so we have some set of representations, um, not necessarily irreducible ones, but let's think about, say, finite representations. And we could label them A, B, C, so on, using boldface. But when we do representation theory, we care not just about the, uh, the representations. What we really want to know about is how we can map between the representations. And so what we want to keep track of are what, what are called morphisms. These are functions, kind of like functions, that map between different representations. Uh, and we can compose invariant tensors. Um, this in the abstract category is called morphism composition. So if I have some morphism from A to B, another morphism from B to C, uh, then I can combine these into some, big, some new morphism from A to C. Um, and every object has an identity morphism. When it composes with other morphisms, it acts like the identity. Um, fairly straightforward. There's also a nice way to keep track of this diagrammatically. Um, we can think of a category as consisting of maps, objects, A and B, and say morphisms, uh, which look like uh, basically lines drawn between the two different objects. Uh, we could draw the identity pretty simply as just a straight line with no box, because if we just compose this with a morphism, it doesn't do anything. Um, we compose morphisms by stacking them. Uh, and this way of stacking them 
uh, makes it very clear that um, morphism composition is associative. Uh, this is because we can interpret this diagram two different ways. We could see it as first we compose F and G and then H, or we could first compose G and H uh, and then F at the end. We could bracket it two different ways. Um, but both ways are equal in a category by definition. Uh, and so we can use the one diagram to represent both possibilities. Now the representations of a group uh, are, are form a very special kind of category. Uh, actually, we'll see there are a lot of special properties this category holds. Um, but for our purposes, a particularly important one is the tensor product. If you have two representations of a group, we can form a new one by tensor producting them together. Uh, in particular, the trivial representation can be tensor producted with any other representation uh, and just produces the old representation out. It, it doesn't do anything. The crucial thing about tensor products is that they don't not only apply to objects, to representations, we can also tensor product together um, invariant tensors. So if we have uh, some tensor mapping A to B, another one mapping C to D, then the tensor product maps A tensor C to B tensor D. Um, now, there's another nice way to represent this diagrammatically. Um, rather than composing these morphisms vertically, when we tensor product, we compose them horizontally. Um, and again, the tensor product has to satisfy a bunch of axioms. Uh, and these axioms all have very nice diagrammatic interpretations. So a simple example of this um, is the associativity. If I were to just to put a third, I guess I can write on this, uh, F. Oh. bold F here, um, then it doesn't matter whether I tensor product F and G first or G and H first. Um, these two things are the same. Um, okay, my handwriting is fairly messy on this. Um, cool. Uh, we also get more interesting diagrams if we include things that involve both tensor products and normal function composition. Um, so this diagram here, uh, we can interpret in two different ways. We can first compose F and G and H and K, and then tensor product them together. Or we could instead split it uh, vertically, do the tensor product here first, and then do this tensor product and compose the two. Uh, and the axioms of a tensor category say that these two things are the same. And you can also check when you have a representation of a group. Uh, this also holds true for invariant tensors. So this just generalizes the normal properties we expect from the tensor product. Uh, and finally, I know this is a lot of definitions, um, but a final important ingredient we have uh, when we study representations of groups is something called a braiding. Um, so when we tensor product things together, when we tensor product A tensor B together, in, a, in general, there's no guarantee that this object has any relation to B tensor A. Um, however, when we do representations of groups, we know that A tensor B is basically the same thing as B tensor A. Um, and this is because they are isomorphic. Uh, in fact, when we study representations of groups, we can think of this isomorphism as just swapping the indices if I have a tensor with an A index and a B index, uh, I can just give you a tensor with a B index and an A index just by swapping the order. Um, but once we generalize to a more abstract setting, we're gonna have to, to include these, this symmetric map um, and tell you how to do this. Um, so we can think of this as kind of like commutativity. Um, Again, the braiding um, satisfies some axioms, and these axioms you can understand from the diagram. So I'm not going to go through all of them, but as some examples, uh, this axiom here says that if you braid A with B tensor C, this is the same as first doing the AB braiding and then doing the AC braiding. Um, similarly, this axiom here says that if we have symmetric uh, tensors and then we swap their order right at the end, uh, that would be the same as if we swapped the order of everything first, and then we tensored together the the, uh, morph the invariant tensors. So here's the abstract version of it. 
it's pretty obvious where it comes from when you just make it into a diagram. Uh, now, in all the cases we're going to be considering, if you sort the order of things twice, you get the identity. Uh, so this means we have what's called a symmetric braiding. Diagrammatically, you can just write it like this, so that if you do the braiding twice, we just get two lines we can pull apart. Um, Actually, braidings that aren't symmetric turn up a lot when we're when studying TQFTs in three dimensions or anions or so on. Um, but for our purposes, we're going to stick to something much simpler, just symmetric braidings. Um, and so after all these definitions, we can finally say what a symmetric tensor category is. It's a category with uh, the tensor product uh, with a braiding that's symmetric. Uh, and it's got some other nice properties. We'll get into we'll we'll get to these a little later, but um, C linearity just says that um, our morphisms are linear. You can add them together. The tensor product respects this. This makes sense. But we care about representations of groups. It, we can add tensor um, ten invariants together. We can multiply them by scalars, and you still get invariants. Uh, the rigidity says essentially that we have um, some notion of a dual vector space. Uh, and semi-simplicity says that we can decompose representations into simple representations. Um, so we'll get to those properties a little more later. But for now, let's think about how to how to formulate the idea that a QFT has a symmetry. Could you say what the C linear meant again? Okay. So C linearity means that the space of morphisms is a vector space. Um, so if I have Two in, so, so if we think about the group theory case, if I have two invariant tensors, F and G, then F plus G is also an invariant tensor. Um, furthermore, I demand that the tensor product is linear. So if I tensor product, say for instance, uh, let me get my pen out, F plus G tensor H should be the same as F tensor H plus G tensor H. So th these are properties that are familiar from representation theory. Uh, and we're going to demand that they hold in a more general setting. Does, does that answer the question? OK, thanks. Yeah. Mm. Um, so let's think about what happens when we have a, a QFT. Or, or we could also think of when we have a, a theory on a lattice. So these x variables here could be space-time variables or lattice variables. Uh, and let's think what it means for it to have a symmetry. Um, so the local operators we have in the theory will be classified by irreducible, rep well, more generally just by representations of the group. Uh, as we've seen, these are objects in the category rep G. Uh, and so we're going to denote it like this. Um, if we have some correlator made of multiple local operators, uh, A1, A transforming in different representations, then the correlation function must be an invariant tensor. Or in other words, it must be a morphism in rep G, mapping all of these to the trivial representation. Um, and if we swap the order of operators, then this is going to be related by the braiding. Because um, remember, without this map here, these two correlators just belong to different tensor, different objects, because the ordering of these um, objects in the tensor product will be different. So in order to relate these two correlators, we need to use this braiding. Um, so now that we've phrased what it means for QFT to have a symmetry in this language, it's very easy to generalize this to cases where our tensor category is not the representation of a group. Uh, it could just be some more abstract tensor category. And as we shall see, this is precisely the kind of structure we need to describe ON models when N is not an integer. So now that I've given this kind of abstract view of what a group symmetry means, I guess it's time to introduce the protagonists of this talk, the Dillon categories. Um, so it turns out that you can construct tensor categories that interpolate between the usual representation categories we have. So if we imagine, for instance, uh, we have some family of groups GN, where N is some integer, say ON or UN or SPN. Um, what the Dillon uh, construction does is it produces some new continuous family of categories, which we'll denote by rep tilde on or rep tilde un or so on. Um, and these are defined for 
arbitrary real values of n. And as we shall see, this is precisely the algebraic structure we need uh, in order to describe the symmetries of analytically continued QFTs. Um, so uh, for the rest of the talk, oh, for this talk, we'll mainly, fo mainly focus on this particular Dylan category, rep tilde ON, which describes um, the ON models. Uh, but the generalization to the other, these other cases is um, fairly straightforward. So let's start by, con let, so we'll now spend a bit of time talking about what exactly these Dylan categories are. Um, so unlike the representations of a group, these categories are going to be described in a purely abstract diagrammatic way. So in this case, we cannot think of the objects in this category as being like vector spaces uh, and the morphisms being invariant tenses or anything concrete. Uh, instead, we describe everything in a diagrammatic way. Um, so the objects, so we'll start by constructing this category rep hat on uh, as a kind of precursor to the Vidalin category. Uh, and then we'll describe how to turn this into the fully fledged rep tilde on that we need to describe uh, QFTs uh, with uh, non-integer n on symmetry. Okay, so let's get to it. Um, the category rep on has objects, uh, 0, 1, 2, and so on, just labeled uh, as collections of dots. So 0 will just be like no dots. 1 will be the case where we have a single dot. 2 will denote two dots, and so on. Um, the morphisms will be diagrams, string diagrams connecting dots. So for instance, uh, we read them from bottom to top. So here we start with one dot. Uh, and we end up with three dots. So this string diagram is a morphism from the one to the three. Here we have a, a more complicated string diagram. Um, this starts with four dots uh, and ends up with two dots. So this is a morphism from the four to the two. Um, do you have anything that matters? Uh, can I ask a question? Mm. So um, in quantum field theory with certain global symmetry, we cannot, uh, so of course we can talk about the local operator correlation function, mm -hmm. but we can also address the correlation function with the symmetry operator. So it's yeah, an yeah. object. Uh, so I assume in this talk, you are only going to generalize uh, the local correlation function to mm -hmm. continuous n, but probably you are not going to, are, are you going to mention anything about correlation function involving symmetry operator or charge operator? Um, we won't discuss this uh, in the talk. Um, we'll mainly focus on local operators and correlators. There are some things you can say about those, but um, yeah, it, for the purposes of this talk, we will not get into that. Okay. Um, but for yeah. continuous and presumably wrap tilde of GN is not the wrap of anything. I, is that correct? That is correct. Uh, yes, it cannot be interpreted as the representation of any group symmetry. But, uh -huh. but the symmetry yeah. operator for integer n is usually an object of uh, the g sub n, right? So for continuous n, mm -hmm. if if uh, if mm -hmm. rep tail dot g n is not a wrap of anything, uh, I, I don't see an immediate generalization, but maybe it's somewhere in your paper. Uh, we don't discuss. One thing that is relevant is when you have a continuous symmetry, it is relatively straightforward to generalize the action of the adjoint. So you can generalize the action of the infinitesimal symmetries. Uh, I guess you're asking though about the full symmetry group itself. Uh, I'm not so sure symmetry? about that. Yeah, but what about um, mm -hmm. when the case the original group is a discrete group? Yeah, in, in which case you don't have an adjoint, so you can't do this. I see. I'm not, I'm not sure um, whether there's a meaningful way. Okay. Certainly it could not be something as naive as you have a symmetry group that's really big or something. It would have to be something more abstract. OK. Um, mm. I see. Thank you. Uh, yeah, probably helpful. I probably should clarify when we're talking about representations of groups for the purpose of this talk, we're only going to be talking about finite dimensional representations. Um, mm -hmm. So um, not, not anything infinite, infinite dimensional or anything like this. Um, so yeah, so rep hat on is this category defined diagrammatically. Um, and now we need to tell you how to, and, and so what I should say is that when we draw these diagrams, the only thing that we care about is how we connect dots. So all of these three diagrams are all equal to each other because the first dot here is connected to the rightmost dot, dot at the top and the other two dots are connected. Uh, anything else is irrelevant. 
Now we will also allow ourselves to take linear combinations of morphisms. Um, so for instance, if we look at the morphisms from two to two, these are the three linear options and we could take any arbitrary linear combination of these to span the entire vector space uh, of two to two, which is going to be three dimensional. Now I need, you to, I need to tell you how to compose morphisms. After all, this is a category, so we need to be able to combine them in some way. Um, but after the diagrammatic uh, diagrams I introduced earlier, hopefully it's, it's clear that we could just do this vertical stacking business to describe uh, morphism composition. So if I have a morphism F and another morphism G, I can define their composition by sticking G on top of F. And then I can just delete the, the dots in the middle and connect everything together. And then I can simplify the diagram if I so choose. Um, in particular, the identity morphism I've defined for any object K is just going to be this diagram here where I connect the leftmost dots together, the, then the next most leftmost dots and so on. So this turns, this means that rep hat on is a, is a category. Um, well, actually I need to tell you one more rule uh, in order to tell you how to compose things. And that's what we do when we get closed loops. So let's say we have these morphisms here, uh, F and G. When we compose them together, we're gonna end up with this closed loop that doesn't connect to any external dots. Uh, and so the rule we use to evaluate this is we replace every closed loop with a factor of N. Um, in particular, uh, if we have a morphism from zero to zero, well, there are no external dots to connect to. So any such morphism has to just be are proportional to some number of loops. And so it's going to have to just be some number times the identity morphism on zero. Um, so the space of morphisms um, from k dots to k dots forms an algebra called the Brow algebra. Uh, and I think this was uh, invented in the 30s by Brow in order to study the representations of ON. Um, and by collecting all these algebras together, we can form a category, rep hat ON, which really encodes uh, like a richer algebraic structure than just the Brouwer algebras individually do. Next, we want to we want to get a tensor product structure on Rep hat on. Remember that we're trying to mimic the usual representation theory of a group. Um, unfortunately, again, there's a very natural way to do this. We can just put the uh, diagrams horizontally next to each other. So when we do this with objects, well, we just can combine the total number of dots. So if I have k1 dots here and k2 dots here, then the tensor product is just going to be the object with k1 plus k2 dots. In particular, uh, the zero object with no dots is going to act as the identity. So this is the analog of the trivial representation in rep hat on. And for morphisms, it's similar. We just stick our diagrams next to each other horizontally. And finally, we need to describe the braiding. Um, again, there's a very natural way to braid uh, if we, we just cross over all of the lines on top of each other. Um, note it doesn't matter whether these braids cross on top or below the other lines, because as we've already noted, the only thing that matters is what dot connects to what dot. Um, so with these properties, uh, rep hat on is a symmetric monoidal category. Uh, but it's not a tensor category. We'll get to why this is the case later. Um, but for now, let's see how this helps uh, explain what a loop model is. So we've already seen the correlators in ON loop models can be thought of as some sort of sum over loop ensembles. So for instance, this four point function is gonna look like we have uh, four defects and we're gonna have to have lines connecting these defects to each other, plus other, other loops. So let's say we, we did the sum over all of these different uh, loop ensembles. Uh, at the end of the day, what we're gonna produce is something formally that looks like this. We're gonna have three morphisms uh, in the Brouwer algebra, each one multiplied by a number. So this C1 is just gonna depend on the four locations of the spin variables, uh, likewise for C2 and C3. So what we want to say is that these four-point correlator in the ON loop model is really just a morphism, the, the four to zero in rep hat ON. 
However, this might be a little unsatisfying um, because after all, we'd hope, for instance, oh, and loop models, we could study, for instance, in Monte, Monte Carlo or um, some other computational method. We better be able to get numbers out somehow. If, if I give you a morphism, how do I know what to measure in the lab to tell you whether the morphism I got was correct? Um, the way to do this is to contract with morphisms from the zero to the four. So remember that this is a morphism from the four to the zero. If we contract with some morphism from the zero to the four, we just get a morphism from zero to zero. And as we've already established, these are all proportional to the identity. So this number of proportionality here is just something we could go physically measure or compute on a Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, and it turns out that as long as n is not an integer, um, knowing this morphism uh, is equivalent to knowing how this morphism uh, can be contracted with any other morphism from the, to the zero to the n. So if you can compute all of these compositions, or at least actually you don't need to compute that many, if you can compute some number of these compositions, you can then reconstruct the original morphism in the theory. Um, so that's how you get numbers out of these loop models. So now that I described right hat on, I can now tell you why this has anything to do with on whatsoever. Um, and the way to see this is to think about the invariance of on itself. So the orthogonal group on is defined as the group, the, the maximal group that preserves some bilinear invariant um, that takes uh, two n-dimensional vectors and gives you a number. So we could try and uh, write this invariant tensor in di diagrammatic form as follows. We associate this delta ij with the indices lowered as this cap map connecting the i and j index. Uh, we can think of the uh, identity map delta ji with a raised and lowered index as mapping i to j. Like this is, looks like the identity. Um, and likewise, we could map we, we could map this delta ij tensor with the indices raised as like the cap map. Um, if we do this, then we find there's a, there's a very simple correspondence between tensor manipulations and diagrammatic relations. So if we do some calculations with the tensors and convert everything into diagrams and do some calculations, we'll get the same answer. For instance, the fact that this is a symmetric tensor corresponds to the fact that if we put a braiding in here, and then these two things are, the, are equal in the Brouwer algebra. Uh, and most importantly for our purposes, if you contract the lowered and the raised uh, delta ij symbol uh, in the on case, then this sums over the diagonals of delta ij. So this will just give you the dimension of the space time n. Uh, whereas if, when we do this in the Brouwer algebra, we just get this little n. So the main difference is that when we do these manipulations with tensors, we have to have an integer. It just doesn't make sense. Um, but in the Brouwer algebra, this little n can be whatever we want. Um, so this is, this is the power of the, the general tensor category approach. Um, it's not limited to integer values of n. Now we can make this a little more formal um, using functors. So what is a functor? A functor is the category theory version of a group homomorphism. So what it does is it maps all of the objects in rep hat on and gives you objects in rep on. It maps all of the morphisms in rep hat on and gives you morphisms in rep on. Uh, and it does it in such a way that all of the nice algebraic properties are preserved. So for instance, it preserves function composition, it's linear, it preserves the tensor product. Uh, when we map the braiding, we get the braiding of rep on. So what this really tells us is that rep hat on captures some subset of the representation theory of rep on. Uh, in particular, it maps the object k into n to the k. Uh, and as you might guess, it maps this cap diagram here into this invariant tensor we described before. Uh, and for instance, the identity map maps to the identity. And I mean, with these rules and the, the knowledge that the tensor product is preserved, you can actually then just check uh, that this tensor here can, can recreate any invariant representation, so any invariant tensor from the n to the n. So what this means is if we want to study tensors that map n to the k to itself, we could instead just, just look at diagrams in rep hat on, study all of those, compute those properties, 
uh, and then only at the end convert everything back to rec on and we would get the same answer. So now that I've shown you that rep hat on can kind of extend the representation theory of the orthogonal group to non-integer values of n, we now need to address a few problems with this category. Uh, we can't have direct sums in this category. There's no notion of n plus n squared, for instance. Um, related to this, there's no such thing as an irreducible representation. I can't decompose the k object into simple representation, into irreducible representations in rep hat on, even though this is a very fundamental thing we do all the time in rep on. Uh, and I've not told you what it means to compute the dimension of a representation or anything like this. So now we're going to spend some time fixing these problems. Um, and the way we fix them is to think first by analogy, how would we solve these problems if we were studying the representations of the orthogonal group? So let's say we wanted to decompose n to the k as a sum of irreducible representations. What does this equation mean? Well, what it really means is that for every irreducible uh, representation AI we have in this direct sum, we have projection and embedding maps uh, so that we can embed the AI into n to the k and to project it back down and get the identity. Um, now, this isn't the only order we can combine these maps. We can also produce a map from n to the k to itself by projecting and then embedding. So we can think of these as projector operators that project onto the subset or the subspace of n to the k that is isomorphic to AI. And it's easy to see that this, this must be an idempotent operator. Uh, when you compose it, this then becomes the identity, so you get PI back. Likewise, if we compose any of these two idempotent operators together, we get zero unless the irreps are the same. Just because you cannot, by Scher's lemma, there's no um, allowed non-zero invariant tenses between two distinct irreducible representations. So this little map, this map in the middle must be zero. Um, so what we've seen really is that if we want to decompose n to the k as a sum of irreducible objects, what we can instead do is we can try and decompose the identity n to the k map as a sum of mutually orthogonal idempotent operators. Uh, and it turns out a general statement about representation theory of compact groups, that there is essentially a unique way to do this, where each projector corresponds to an irreducible representation. Now this procedure I've just described to you is something we can do in rep on. It only involves knowing the morphisms from n to the k to, to n to the k. So let's, for instance, consider trying to find idempotence from two to two. So in this case, there are three linearly independent diagrams, which I've given to you here, the identity, the braiding, and this cap co-cap map. Uh, after a bit of work, what you can do is check that these three uh, um, morphisms are idempotent. Each of them squares to, to itself, and they're mutually orthogonal. Um, and in fact, if you look at them, this looks suspiciously like the decomposition of uh, a rank two tensor in the orthogonal group into a trivial, a symmetric, and an anti-symmetric part. Or... Now we've seen how we can kind of reproduce the decomposition of, um, of, of representations into irreducible representations. The next question is, how do we compute the dimensions of these things? Um, in rep one one way to compute the dimension is by computing the trace of the operator. The trace of the projector will tell you the dimension of the subspace it projects down onto. Uh, now, there is a nice diagrammatic way to compute this trace in rep hat on We take a morphism f, and we just connect all of the dots from the top to the dots on the bottom in this way. For instance, if we do this to the projector P1 we defined earlier, uh, we find that we get the identity because the circle gives a factor of n that cancels out the 1 over n in the definition of P1. So this is a little like a one-dimensional representation. We can do the same procedure for the anti-symmetric projector, in which case we find we get n, n minus 1 over 2. We get the dimension you'd expect for an anti-symmetric representation. 
Um, we can do the same thing for the symmetric projector. Uh, and again, we reproduce the expected answer. What we see is that for any n equal one to or any positive integer, the number we compute matches precisely the dimension of the corresponding on representation. And in fact, this is no accident. Uh, one can check that the functor that maps rep hat on to rep on preserves the trace. What this means is that if I compute this diagrammatic trace, I will get the same answer as if I first convert the diagrams into invariant tenses and then compute the trace. So we have seen that we can find in impotence uh, and we can compute their dimensions. So we're really able to completely extend the representation theory of the orthogonal group to non-integer n. Uh, and a nice result from Wenzel proves that essentially this decomposition is unique in the same way that the decomposition of a regular group uh, irreducible, so a group representation into irreducible reps is unique. Um, so we can continue, we can do this procedure for arbitrary k and find the quote unquote irreducible representations of on, except there's one catch. Uh, and you'll see that if you stare at these formulas for the representations of the symmetric and anti-symmetric uh, projector. When we put n equal to one in these formulas, these will have dimension zero. If we think about what this me what happens for the orthogonal group O1, this makes a lot of sense. This orthogonal group is just isomorphic to Z2. The only thing you can do in one dimension is flip the sign of the, the single component. Um, so there is no symmetric and no anti-symmetric representation for this group. Um, but that's not what happens in rep hat on. Rep hat on still has these representations. They just have dimension zero. So we'll call such projectors, um, which have trace zero, null idempotents. We can now ask what happens to these null idempotents under this functor S. I've told you S translates diagrams into invariant tenses. Um, well, the only option is that it translates these projectors into zero. So this is not a, um, this functor is not like one-to-one. -one. Uh, it, it kills uh, null impotence. Now, another nice result, also due to Wenzel, uh, is that these null impotence only exist for non-integer, so for integer values of n. When n is not an integer, these traces are always not zero. So now we've seen that rep hat on kind of satisfies everything we'd want um, in order to generalize. Well, it allows us to compute everything we'd want if we wanted to understand what representation theory would mean for on when n is not an integer. But it's not perfect. Uh, the projectors we've defined, while they correspond to what you might consider irreducible representations, they don't really correspond to any objects in rep hat on. Uh, remember when we do the tensor product decomposition in rep G, these projectors really do correspond to embedding and projecting down onto objects. Um, so what the Dillon category does, rep tilde on, uh, is it fixes this by adding in projectors, by adding in objects for each of these projectors. This process is called a Karubi completion. Uh, and then it makes sure that you can always do direct sums, which is called an additive completion. So these two uh, things here are two general procedures you can apply to categories in order to make sure that you can split it impotence uh, and always direct some things. So I don't want to get into the details here because the actual definition of these is kind of technical, um, but it is a very broad and generally applicable tool. Uh, and once we do this, we then have a symmetric tensor category uh, where we can do representation theory of ON, but N doesn't have to be an integer. So we can write equations like this, n tensor n goes to one plus n plus, plus the symmetric plus the anti-symmetric, and they make sense for any real value of n. Um, so let's just complete the circle and uh, explain exactly what the, the irreducible representations are in this category. Uh, well, in category theory language, we call an object simple if the only mappings from it to itself are proportional to the identity. Uh, so this is the categorical notion of what an irreducible representation is uh, when we look at the representations of a compact group. Uh, and Dillon has found and constructed all of the simple objects in Reptil de ON. Uh, 
And when you do this, you, it's essentially a combinatorial argument. And you find they precisely generalize the irreducible representations you find in rep Owen for integer n. Uh, and their dimensions are given by the analytic continuation of the VAR formula. So everything kind of works as you might hope. Um, you can nicely analytically continue this representation theory. Can I ask uh, a question? <clears throat> yeah, sure. Is, is it necessary that n is real? Can it be complex? Uh, I see no reason n has to be real. It could be complex. I'm not really sure of any application for n not being real, but uh, yeah, it could be any, it could be complex. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Hmm. Um, so one other thing, let's talk about semi-simplicity. So semi-simplicity for a category essentially says that any object can be split up into a, into, into a sum of simple objects. Uh, so it turns out, again, a result due to one soul, uh, wrap tilde O n is semi-simple. So every object is the direct sum of simple objects. So if we care, what we really care about is just looking at the simple objects. Just like in representation theory, we're mostly interested in the irreducible representations. Now it turns out when n is not an integer, the null lead impotence we have cause problems. Uh, but the functor, there is a functor s tilde, which is just the, the, func the equivalent to the original s we had for our pad o n, uh, that maps all of these null lead impotence to zero. Uh, so precisely getting rid of all the null in impotence from rep tilde on gets you back to the regular representation category. So we really have a picture that looks like this. We have a continuous family of categories rep tilde on uh, defined for any value of n. Uh, and they're all nice and semi-simple uh, categories, except when n is an integer. Precisely when n is an integer, some of the representations of o, rep tilde o n have zero dimension. And this causes problems um, from semi-simplicity. Uh, and to fix it, we can just get rid of these null in impotence. Uh, and this functor then maps us, not only gets rid of the null in impotence, but maps us to rep o n, to the normal representation category theory, to the normal representations we know and love for n equal one, two, and three. Um, now you might ask actually what happens when n is zero, minus one, minus two, and so on. Uh, it actually turns out that when n is minus two, minus four, minus six, and so on, these categories describe the representations of the symplectic group. Um, unfortunately, I don't think I'll have time to explain why this is in detail. Um, but it's, it's actually um, a very close link between these two different um, groups. Um, so finally, we have our uh, complete version of what it means for an ON, for a loop model to have ON symmetry when N is not an integer. Again, local operators are classified by objects in the Delin category rep tilde ON, correlate as amorphisms, and the different order operator orders are related by the braiding. I haven't quite explained where the braiding comes, how the braiding extends from rep hat ON to rep tilde ON, but you can extend it. Um, so now, I guess in the remaining 10 minutes, I'll talk a little bit about what these QFTs with categorical symmetries look like. Uh, so here is again our general definition. Uh, operators are objects, correlators are morphisms, braidings relate different orders. So in our paper, we show that one can define formal path integrals. In some sense, these actually generalize Grassmannian uh, integrals uh, and have a fairly similar flavor to those. And we show that perturbation theory um, reproduces what you might naively continue um, these symmetries. So that's nice. If you've been doing formal continuations, you don't need to lose any sleep about whether it makes sense or not. We've got you covered. Um, we also show that there's a notion of continuous categorical symmetries and that in certain circumstances, these lead to conserved currents. So very much like Noda's theorem generalized. Um, and that categorical symmetries can be broken both explicitly uh, and spontaneously. So again, these, these QFTs with categorical symmetries are pretty well behaved, very similar to the QFTs we're, we're used to. Um, but QFTs are fairly unconstrained. Uh, so to say more about what kind of theories can have categorical symmetries, uh, it's nice to add a few more assumptions and to restrict ourselves to conformally invariant theories. Uh, so we're going to make the technical assumptions that the dilation operator is diagonal and the OPs converge amongst other things. Um, 
just so that we can analyze and say anything about these theories. Um, obviously, these hold for unitary theories with uh, global symmetries. Uh, so when we have a CFT with categorical symmetry, the two-point functions are now going to be constrained both by conformal symmetry quite strongly uh, and also by the categorical symmetry. So this two-point function can only be non-zero uh, if A1 tends A2 maps to one in a non-trivial way. Um, now this is where rigidity comes in. So I'm, I can't go into the details, but rigidity essentially is a sort of inverse uh, object. Uh, or it's like a dual object that satisfies some relations. Uh, and so when we have rigid categories, we have a guarantee that they're always, for every phi A1, there will exist at least some object that has the right structure in order to have a non-zero two-point function. Of course, if OPEs converge, this is necessary for phi to be non-zero. Um, likewise, three-point functions, again, um, they're going to be constrained to be some sort of conformal structure multiplied by some categorical structure, some morphism from A1 tends A2 tends A3 to 1. Uh, and if our tensor category is nice and semi-simple, it turns out the space of such morphisms here is finite. So like in a normal uh, CFT, we have some finite number of OPE coefficients to work with. Um, and we can also, so I guess I've jumped the gun a bit, but we can do the OPE. Now, the OP is a little different in that we're going to have to have a morphism that doesn't map to the one. Uh, so we end up with equations like this, where we should interpret this you know, limit as we're subtracting off other operators that we don't care about. Uh, and what this would really mean is that we have the equality between these two morphisms, uh, regardless of what operators we insert in here. So like in a normal CFT, we can define a notion of OPE. Uh, and we can relate this OPE to the um, three-point functions if we like. Uh, and once we do all this, we are then in a position to, to define bootstrap equations, uh, which will look, again, very much like normal bootstrap equations. So we sum over all operators that appear in, say, the A tensor A. Um, we, sum, we then have a conformal structure, which will depend on the dimension and the spin of the exchanged operator. And then we'll have some category symmetry, some morphism here, which will be built out of the OPE coefficients of the operator O with the phi phi's. Um, and if we do this uh, decomposition in different channels, we'll get some crossing equations, which you could then try and solve. So it looks very similar to the usual story with, with CFTs. Um, just a reminder, these crossing equations might look a bit abstract, because what we're really saying is two morphisms are equal. But we can convert these into regular equations just by contracting with various morphisms from the 1 to the 8 to the 4. And then we'll just get a series of equations, linear equations, um, to solve. So let's finish by stating two properties of CFTs that have categorical symmetry. The first one is the completeness of the global spectrum. What this says is our CFT, which satisfies some technical assumptions, has a local operator transforming in the object A1 and another object transforming in the A2, then it must contain operators transforming in every irreducible, so every representation V that appears in A1 tends to A2. Uh, and unsurprisingly, the way you have to prove this is through the crossing equations. What we can consider is a correlator like this. Uh, in the limit where x2 goes to x1 and x4 goes to x3. Uh, we'll then find that this is dominated by the two-point function, the products of the two-point functions, plus some higher order corrections. So now the, the trick to proving this is then a category theory uh, exercise in showing that the only way to reproduce this structure here in the cross-channel requires every, um, every simple object be in A1 tends A2 to exist. Um, so while we've stated this for categorical symmetries, it's worth noting this also just holds for normal CFTs with global symmetries G. Uh, and I'm not sure this has actually been proven in the literature before. Um, so the second thing we show um, is that these, these categorical symmetries preclude unitarity. Um, you cannot have a theory with a categorical symmetry that is unitary. Um, so to, def to ex exactly explain how we can prove this, we first need to think about what unitarity could mean. Um, 
So at the level of a category, what we want is some notion of complex conjugation. So what I want is given any morphism f from a to b, I want to be able to say that the conjugate of f is some map from a bar to b bar. So if we think about, for instance, the representations of complex group like un, uh, we can conjugate the tensors to produce new invariant tensors. Obviously, we can also do this in rep on, for instance. It's just this star will act very trivially. Um, nothing says that this star has to do anything interesting to our, to our morphisms or, or operators. Now, if we have a real CFT, a, a CFT with some reality condition, what this means is that we can extend this star to some sort of dagger that acts on local operators such that if we conjugate the correlator, this is the same as computing the correlation function involving the dagger or the adjoint of the correlators themselves. I guess I probably should have flipped the order here, but that doesn't matter too much. Um, and so if we want unitarity, what we want is some sort of positivity condition on this dagger. Um, it's not quite clear what the correct positivity condition is on, because this correlator here is just gonna be some abstract morphism, A1 tends to A. So presumably the correct positivity condition says something about contracting this morphism with other morphisms, and it's always, always has to be positive. Uh, but it turns out for our purposes, it doesn't matter. It'll be sufficient to look at the singlet sector. So the singlet sector are those operators that transform trivially. Uh, for this sector, we can just ask the regular question, do we have you know, reflection positivity or unitarity or whatever specifically, specific property we require for unitarity? Uh, and it turns out, uh, and we show in the paper, that if a CFT has a categorical symmetry and a unitary singlet sector, then the category must be equivalent to the representations of a group for some, for some compact group. Um, as a corollary, this shows us that the ON loop models when N is not um, an integer, uh, and likewise the QPOTS model when Q is not an integer, are necessarily non-integer, uh, non-unitary. Uh, and this is simply because uh, in both these cases, the representations we need are fractional dimensional, they're not, they're not integers. And so there's no way that these categories could be rewritten as the representations of some group. Um, so I'll just briefly outline how you prove such results. Uh, the first thing you do is prove that if your group, if, if your representation category has negative dimensional um, objects, uh, and operators transforming in these negative dimensional objects, uh, then you can necessarily construct a singlet that violates unitarity. And as you might expect this again, you prove using the crossing equations. Um, and the second proposition is, uh, is a proposition about symmetric tensor categories. It states that if a tensor category has no negative dimensional objects, it must be isomorphic to rep G for some group G. And this is a corollary of Delin's theorem on tensor categories, a very powerful result which classifies sufficiently nice tensor categories uh, and shows that these have to be representations of supergroups. Um, so applying these two together, we find if our CFT has a unitary singlet sector, it has to have a regular group symmetry. Um, so to summarize, we've argued that symmetric tensor categories are the correct algebraic structure to use when you want to generalize symmetries to non-integer n. Uh, and in particular, the Lin category rep tilde on uh, is precisely what generalizes uh, the orthogonal group symmetry to this case. Um, and we've also seen that theories with uh, categorical symmetries can be well defined, uh, at least at the level of local operators and correlation functions, without any recourse to analytic continuation or things like this. We can just define them uh, as objects in their own right to study. Uh, we can apply standard QFT tools to studying them, like the crossing equations, uh, but these theories are necessarily not unitary. Um, so that was uh, all I had to say. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you very much. Any questions? Can I ask that question? Yes. So in this theories, can you define non perturbative uh, objects? Like you said, you can define formally but integral, but does it make sense to discuss instant or things like this? Um, it's not clear. So at the level of loop models, it seems like there's nothing wrong with defining these as some sort of non perturbative objects in their own right. I'm not sure if when you started, if you start analyzing it from the perspective 
of a formal path integral, whether this works. Uh, it is less clear to me. Um, it seems like the lattice model is the safer way to go about it. And the theorem you just proved, is it valid only for the ON or no, most it, it, cases? The, the unitarity theorem? Yes, yes. It's valid for all cases. So, I mean, to understand exactly the domain of validity, um, you have to, I mean, yeah, it is valid for any categorical symmetry C. So if you have a symmetric tensor category and your theory uh, is described by correlators uh, that take values in this category, then yeah, it must be the representations of the group. It, it's, gen it's valid in general. Okay, thank you. Uh, you mentioned a couple Thanks. times that um, these tensor categories for SPN are well defined, mm. but I'm wondering if that also needs a caveat about the epsilon tensor, which you discuss in your paper in the context of SLN. Um, so SPN doesn't have this problem. Um, so, so the caveat with ON, uh, I could explain to people who are who aren't familiar, um, is when we construct. Let's say we wanted to study SON rather than ON. The differences between these two groups is that in SON you have an anti-symmetric tensor. But the size of this anti-symmetric tensor depends on how many space-time dimension, on the, on the dimension ON. So if you have SO2, then you have an anti-symmetric tensor uh, with two indices. SO3 has three indices. SO4 has four indices. Um, so you see you can't represent this diagrammatically for arbitrary continuous values of n. There's just, it doesn't make sense to consider an anti-symmetric tensor with 3.5 indices. So while we can continue on to, to, to non-integer values, uh, it's, there's no similar way in which you can continue the representation theory of SON. So what Connor, Connor is asking is about SPN, but I believe this problem just doesn't occur. You don't have to worry about such um, extra additional invariants. Um, Even though symplectic matrices have determinant one, so you can define an epsilon. Well, well so the, you're thinking of the, the the definition of the matrices, but what you want to look at is the um, invariance on the vectors. So you can define the symplectic group as the group of matrices that preserve a, a certain inner product. And I don't think you there's no other invariance. I think you're allowed to consider. Um, there's no equivalent of ON versus SON for SP and So all the invariant tensors can be made out of the involution then? Yeah, yeah, so just this uh, yeah, anti-symmetric um, thing with two indices, yeah. Hmm. The um, diagram do you know? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, okay thanks. Um, do you know whether this approach could be extended to understand, for example, higher form symmetries? Uh, I have no idea. I mean, at the moment, the, this approach is really about global symmetries. Uh, so I, I don't really know how this would interact with, with higher form symmetries at all. Um, I think it's probably related also to Shu Heng's question about uh, the symmetry operators because these are extended and I don't know. Mm, mm. I, I mean, certainly people consider very rich ten, like, categorical structures, um, but they're usually kind quite different from these ones and that they're braided. Um, and they interact quite non-trivially with the topology of your space time. Whereas this case is, is simple. We're not really worrying about topology or anything like this, but maybe, I'm not sure. Yeah, all right, thanks. So the diagrams you draw are very similar, perhaps identical to this uh, bird track diagram mm, mm, mm. by Chivitanovich. Uh, yeah, yeah, th this has a long history, I think. Um, I would highly recommend Chudinovich's book on bird tracks for anyone interested um, in the diagram, diagrammatic approach. Um, I think it's the best book I found on the topic. Um, but I believe these diagrams have been reinvented about four or five or six times. I know Penrose came up with versions, as you've seen here, Brower did. Um, it's, it's very interesting, actually, that it's been reinvented many times, but as far as I can tell, independently by different authors. Um, not really aware of their work, each other's work. And one of the things that Shvidanovich discusses in, in the appendix of his book is this funny analytic continuation between exceptional algebras. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, the Lin or the Lin series, the way we refer to yeah. it. Yeah. 
anything that you think could be done for that? Um, I mean, I think I had a slide right at the end. I, I have a, a bunch of slides, um, but I can probably explain the issue with this uh, in general. Let me look. So the conjecture of Delin that uh, Leonardo is referring to is, is a family like this. Um, so we have a series of exceptional Lie uh, algebras and also some non-exceptional ones. Uh, and Dillon conjectured that these all belong to a continuous family of categories, a bit like Rep ON or Rep SPN. Uh, and actually, uh, even better, Vogel has conjectured that there's a two-dimensional family that includes not only all of the exceptional ones, it also includes Rep ON, Rep SPN, Rep UN. Uh, so this two-dimensional Vogel plane kind of encapsulates all of the semi-simple Lie algebras. Now the problem, the way these conjectures are structured, are essentially, so the diagrams we've been considering are, are very simple. Um, you just have caps and co-caps and things like this. Uh, if you want to study Lie algebras, one way you would do this uh, is rather than by studying two-point things, you might include higher point vertices. Uh, and you might start demanding relationships on these. For instance, you could diagrammatic, you could have a diagrammatic version of the Jacobi relation or so on. Um, and so this is the basic idea behind these families. Um, now there are other families also, so those in the know might recognize this as being related to the magic square, which is another kind of numerological construction of Lie algebras. Uh, and so there are conjectures also existed for other rows of the magic square related to the F4, E6, and E7 families. Each of these are essentially based around introducing some higher point vertices, demanding some algebraic relation, and then saying, let's just allow parameters to vary and not just be integers. Um, the problem with proving these conjectures is that if you just think about the combinatorics, there are a lot of different ways you can combine three and four and five and six point vertices. Um, there are you know, huge numbers of relations you need to check. Uh, and so what Thurston found for these F4 and E6 families was that if I think you needed to combine five or six vertices together, like a fairly large amount. So we, what he used as a computer to do this, he showed that the, you could only get consistency for all the relations he imposed um, for if a certain polynomial was satisfied. Uh, and this polynomial only has a finite number of roots. So what this shows is that, the, is that there's not a continuous family for these things only discrete values are allowed. So the open question is whether for the Delin family and for the Z7 family, whether the relations you have to impose uh, can be satisfied in general or whether you need some special polynomial to hold. And as far as I can tell, this is just a completely open problem. Um, so I don't know. Um, I'd love for someone to, to work it out. Thank you. Any further questions? I'd like to ask, can you um, define things like uh, twisted sectors, twist operators, or befolding in this theories? Um, that's a good question. I'm not really sure. Uh, I guess the best context you could try and answer this is by looking at the two-dimensional models, like the Q-pots and the ON models. Um, I, I, I'm not that familiar with 2D CFTs, but I'm sure there are, there are people who are who would be able to, to answer those questions. Um, okay, thanks. Well, I, I can think I can comment that in in OAN models one can consider twisted partition functions. Can, can or can't? Can can yeah. can, it was positive. I didn't I didn't hear if you, if you can or you can't. I believe one can. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks. Because I mean, how, how does it work? Because when I think of a twist operator, I think like I need to, if I bring an operator around, I pick up a group element. But in this context, what, what happens instead? Well, you just insert some boundary conditions which correspond to a projector on a particular representation. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So the particular, insert a particular projector like the ones that Damon constructed. Okay. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Well, if not, thank you very much, Damon. Beautiful talk, and you're staying up late to talk to us.
uh, and we'll see everybody who wants to come next week at the usual time of 12 noon Eastern. Thank you, everybody.